welcome to the Masters in Fine Arts and Cultural Leadership webinar tonight. My name is Carolyn Brown and I've had the pleasure of being the course leaders of this wonderful course since the beginning of 2019. I would like to acknowledge that I'm currently situated on the country of the Ngunnawal people in regional New South Wales, whose traditional custodians have cared for the land, water and stories of these lands for generations. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and note that sovereignty was never ceded. I also acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us this evening. I'm delighted to introduce you to two wonderful cultural leaders joining me here in this conversation. Firstly, Yasmin Masri. Yasmin was a member of the inaugural cultural leadership cohort, graduating in 2018 and the recipient of the Lynn Williams Award for Outstanding Cultural Leadership. Yasmin has worked as an artist, curator, creative producer, and cultural strategist. Her background is in craft and design, graduating with first class honours from a, from a Bachelor of Design Arts at the Australian National University in 2013. Yasmin has worked on cultural events, including the Design Canberra Festival, the Australian Ceramics Triennial, and the London Design Biennial. She has also co-founded and co-directed several independent artist initiatives around Canberra, including the noted Writers' Festival. Yasmin is currently the Arts and Cultural De uh, Development Coordinator with the City of Ryde here in Sydney. Craig Middleton. Craig is a third year student in the Cultural Leadership course, currently working on his final subject, the International Placement Case Study. Craig is a community engaged museum professional with a background in social, political and art history. Craig is a highly experienced curator, researcher and advocate. His research interests are in community engagement practices and museums, LGBTIQ plus histories, political histories and critical museology. He has worked with the Centre of Democracy in South Australia and is an elected member of the Australian Museums and Galleries Association National Council. His book, co-authored with Dr. Nikki Sullivan, Queering the Museum, was published by Routledge in November 2019. Craig is the Assistant Manager, Exhibitions and Planning at the National Museum of Australia, where he is deeply involved in creating new dimensions to the museum's work in exhibitions, collections and engaging with communities. Thank you both for joining me this evening. Before we start our conversation, I would like to provide a brief overview on the cultural leadership course. The course was established in 2016 to meet a much needed platform for inspiring innovative leadership in the arts and cultural sector. An academic course that builds on the connections and synergies across disciplines, and develops leadership values around inclusivity, collaboration, shared knowledges, and aspirational thinking. It is a course imbued with a commitment to empower transformational change, and it challenges students to question and debate the role of the cultural sector in our society and their own place within it. It is designed specifically for those already active, who already have active roles in the cultural sector and who aspire to facilitate new and resilient leadership models. Students are encouraged to exchange and collaborate in innovative approaches to creative and professional practice. Delivered over 30 months, the part-time course offers online learning and four face-to-face -face intensives each year at NIDA in Sydney. Topics include leadership in governance, cultural policy and practice, entrepreneurial modelling, communication, advocacy, cultural transformation and sustainability, research generated through practice and international leadership models. Course subjects are taught by experienced cultural leaders in the arts industry and supported by senior NIDA academics. We offer students unprecedented access to exceptional cultural leaders as guest speakers, panelists and assessors. Cohort sizes average between 10 to 15 students who come from every state and territory and who work in a, in a wide range of practices, including the performing arts, 
libraries, museums and galleries, festivals, state and local government, writers' centres, independent producing, film, design and community cultural development. I'll provide a little more detail at the end of the session, but now we can hear firsthand from Yasmin and Craig about their experiences with the course. So to kickstart our conversation, I'm sure that prospective applicants would like to hear about your work and your experience in the arts and cultural sector and what led you to the cultural leadership course and why. So perhaps Yasmin, would you be happy to go first? Sure thing. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Um, so my background at the time that I was applying for this course is that I was working in a lot of, um, so I was working within uh, an arts organisation, a non-profit arts organisation, but I was also doing a lot of um, work in artist-run initiatives and community-led arts programs outside of that. And um, I get, think especially from the work that I was doing uh setting up artist-run initiatives and particularly the Writers Festival that I was working on, I realised that there was sort of a gap in my knowledge, particularly around leadership and um, understanding things that are more strategic, sector level, um, understanding how different parts of government policy, other arts organisations all connected up together. And I really was looking at something at that um, higher, bigger picture arts level to uh, develop my skills and practice. So that was kind of the motivator for me. And then I guess just on the other end, because I did graduate um, at the start of 2018, uh, I came out of that having changed jobs a couple of times along the way, but also realising that I was really interested in the work that you could do in arts, cultural policy and strategy uh, within the government space. And um, through the experiences that I gained through um, the cultural leadership course, I then realised that I was really interested in local government and the role local government played in developing arts sectors and ecosystems. And that really helped me to move into the current role that I'm in. Mm. Thank you. I'd love to come back to that as well, actually, the whole local government side of things. Sure. What about you, Craig? How did, how did a, it all come back? Yeah, that was really fascinating, Yasmin. It's, I remember uh, talking about this very thing in one of our intensives. And it's just really fascinating where everybody's, you know, motivation and intention comes from when they decide to do something like this. For me, uh, I was uh, living in South Australia. I was uh, the curator of the Centre of Democracy, which is uh, one of the museums of the History Trust of South Australia. So I'd worked my way uh, through that organisation. Um, uh, social history organ social history museum organization and I had reached a point uh, in my career where I was wanting a bit more I was a uh, you know modestly a good curator I was a great curator I knew what I was doing I knew my craft um, and you know I was really confident in that space and I was thinking about how I could take that to another level particularly in terms of thought leadership I think is where it sort of emerged from initially and so you know in those the few years before I jumped into NIDA I'd also joined a few not-for-profit boards um, and the Australian Museums and Galleries Association being one of those and you know that really showed me that I was in a bit of a bubble a museum bubble and you know I had been in state government for you know eight or nine years and talking to museum professionals and going to museums conferences and advocating on museums issues that probably really only relate to those working in institutions and when I was on uh, when I began on the uh, Australian Museums and Galleries Associations board I realized that you know the advocacy work that was happening at that level was always in the context of a much broader uh, ecosystem and so I became really conscious of, of my position and you know one of the the drivers or there was a couple of key drivers for me in terms of deciding to apply for NIDA one was to get to give myself permission to engage with the the, the academia and the theory around policy um, and governance and leadership, which until that point I hadn't given myself permission to, and I probably wasn't going to do <laughs> do that by myself. 
And uh, the other motivator was to just interact and meet people from different art forms, from different organisations of scale. So, you know, thinking about the fact that I'm quite privileged to work in these large institutions, government institutions, and over the last few years I've been connecting with independent producers and theatre makers and and people who run small to medium arts organisations and it's really, you know, changed the way, you know, I understand my place. And so that was a real key motivator for me too, the people I might encounter. I know, I think it's certainly one of the things that, I think it's an inevitable evolution that is occurring in the arts and cultural sector, but there was certainly in this course as a place where that interdisciplinary approach and the knowledge that you share with each other and that learning that comes from, oh, this is how we do it in the library world, or this is how we do it through community cultural development, or it's incredibly empowering, I think, isn't it, for the kind of work that you do. How, when, when, from the perspective of having, for you, Yasmin, having completed the course, um, what do you think with, um, and I'm going to ask you both about some challenges and then come back to the course. What what would you say were, were a couple of the critical issues for leaders in the cultural context five years ago, six years ago, and what do you think they might be now? Mm, that's a quite a tough question. I mean, I think there's probably some continuing threads that sadly have not gone anywhere with funding probably being the most obvious one coming straight to mind, particularly, um, I guess, because the majority of my experience has been gained in that independent small to medium end of the spectrum. And really, like we've seen since, what was it, 2015, you know, cuts, 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 and no real replenishing. And then going through COVID, where obviously then you know, so many people losing their work literally overnight and then wave after wave of lockdown that's happened since then that continues to create instability within the sector. So I think kind of the economic context continues to be a challenge throughout, um, but what's causing those challenges maybe changes a little bit. Um, yeah, so I think that's really been a big challenge. I think there certainly are some elements of opportunity in the time that we're in at the moment with the fact that we've all been forced online a lot more and we've been forced to diversify and experiment with other models. But I, I think, you know, that is a silver lining, but there's still a lot of challenge within the sector and within what's going on at the moment. And also possibly like the repercussions of what's going on with COVID and how that's imp impacting, again, really specifically that kind of independent through to small to medium end of, this, end of the sector. I think we're really going to see the consequences of that in a few years' time. I mean, the other um, thing from my perspective that I think is a challenge within the sector, again, uh, this time with like kind of a craft and design lens on, is just big cuts to universities and to university courses. And so, for example, the programs that I went through that were really skills and craft-based programs have been, I think, quite radically cut back even since when I graduated. And so you're just going to see um, skills gaps coming along and that will probably, again, only hit in sort of five or ten years' time when the people who normally would be there haven't been able to have those pathways. Yeah, that's an important point. Mm -hmm. Eric, what would, they, what would they be for you, some of those challenges that you I think, thought you might um, be talking about? Yeah, yeah, no, no. I think um, Yasmin hit it, hit the nail on the head when they said instability. Uh, in particularly, you know, you can't ignore what's happening around us with the pandemic uh, and the impact um, it, it it's had on you know multiple sectors, but the arts sector specifically. But I think when I'm thinking about instability, I'm thinking about these issues of sustainability and diversity and you know um you know marginalization that have been chipping away and chipping away and slowly people attempt to not rectify it's probably the wrong word but you know try and 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 make change in those spaces and if nothing else what the pandemic has done is really highlighted that the ideas and the structures and the institutions that uphold those values are not sustainable and so some of the key challenges you know moving forward for me 
it's really about finding those opportunities to to think deeply about how we can make some change in those structures, how we can experiment and how we can be brave and courageous with what we're doing. Because this is also, as much as it is a challenge and it's, it's heralded great instability, it's also a great opportunity for us to be, you know, bringing people along in ways they've never been brought along before. And so, the the issues are the same, but there, you know, there's just great opportunity right now to actually challenge everything we think we know and everything, you know, we believe true to be about the sector and shake it up and actually look critically at, at you know, our role in upholding um, some pretty awful things. No, I think that's so important. I think I think certainly the last 18 months has highlighted some cultural practices really that we have inadvertently or deliberately upheld for a long time. I think one of the things that I, I have found very challenging is that when, um, particularly through last year, particularly through 2020, that was so disruptive um, and, and so dramatically disruptive was actually a time when so many people were talking about, oh my gosh, this is the time for us to rethink, to restructure, to reimagine, to re to 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 pull things apart. And and you know, we've been running around in a circle in a treadmill for so long and and you know we've got to create the space in terms of safety for teams and artists and right through to um, the constant you know funding cycle, etc. But I think generally what happened really from the beginning of the year when things opened up a bit was that everyone just went straight back into old patterns and old routines because we've got all of last year to catch up on and now we're working three times as hard as we were. And I wonder what it is there. What would, what do you, you know, through this, the lens of cultural leadership, what, what are the things that we can bring to bear that help to sustain the risk? but also I guess the rigor and the responsibility of creating change that does improve that we, uh, our role and the work of arts and cultural work in, the, in our society. Who would like to tackle that? <laughs> um, I mean, I think one thing perhaps, and just again to kind of perhaps link it back up to some of the conversations in the course, I think part of it is sort of, being comfortable sitting in uncertainty and leading from a position of uncertainty. And I think anyone who pretends to be doing otherwise at the moment is like, guys, come on, what's going on in the world? No one knows anything. So I think it's sort of, yeah, acknowledging acknowledging that uncertainty and, um, yeah, touching on all the things Craig said as well. I think that's, you're exactly right. Like now's the time to question who's in the room, who's having the conversations, who's making decisions and trying to allow space for more diversity in those voices and for doing things a bit differently. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing as well, I actually remember this quote from one of the subjects. It was with Ang Harrod, um, and we were we did read a paper. I now can't remember who wrote the paper, but it was all about less for longer. And I've used that as a thing in my head since doing that course, which is just like sometimes it's actually really hard and an uncomfortable position to just slow down. And I think I'm getting a bit better at it, but it's something I definitely still have to be really mindful of. And I think you're exactly right, Carolyn. Like felt like we could do things totally differently last year. And then as soon as the world started opening back up, it was like, we'll pump out those events, pump out, you know, all business as usual. And I think sometimes it's quite hard to be like, no, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to wait. I'm going to see what's happening and be responsive to that. So. And the rhetoric around what happened last year was that people pivoted, right? And I think it was uh, Kia Winesmith, who's a, uh, digital guru in museum said to me, actually, what most people did was not pivot. They just redirected their resources to things they were already doing away from the things they couldn't do anymore. And so there's almost kind of like the 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 conversations and the discussions and the rhetoric around that was like, oh, hey, we did that. We changed. We're good. And then things open up a bit and then we have to make, like get those visitors through the door and we have to sell those tickets and raise, raise that revenue. And I think what maybe didn't happen also was people taking the time to reflect rather than just rushing into a different kind of programming, perhaps. Yeah. 
And exactly, just to extend on that, credit as well, because it's like we almost have to actually change the measures of success and 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 get that buy-in from really a senior leadership. Otherwise, you're always going to revert back to, as you say, like people through the door, ticket sales, things like that. So it's, mm-hmm. it's pretty, it's, yeah. And, and, it, and indeed, one of the challenges at NIDA actually is that um, – you know, we did a course review of the cultural leadership program last year and we're implementing those changes this year, which was very much around shifting some of the, um, the, the, the content and the subjects in a way that led more progressively through the, the course. Um, NIDA itself is currently going through a curic- what it's calling a curriculum renewal pro- uh, project, which is looking at all of the courses uh, And what's really fascinating about that is the challenge that we all have, whether you're in an educational institution or running an organisation or running your own business, is what has been that reflective process. And when we have said things about embedding First Nations knowledge, bringing in different voices, how are we actually creating the space for that to happen? And I think that's one of the the real challenges in leadership, where whoever you are in an organisation or in your independent practices that how do you how do you show that leadership which is taking the time and carving out the space to create the new voices the new spaces in our work and I'm not sure that we're seeing that so that point you're making Craig about the pivot was not really a pivot because a real pivot would have seen very different outcomes and perhaps Perhaps there are organ well there are certainly organizations and individuals who are working along those lines. I think the ongoing challenge will be how to do that within a mainstream Western context, but how to do it completely outside that context as well. Do Yasmin, for you in a local government context, has that been are you seeing change within local governments working? you know, not not solely from the last 18 months, but certainly working within the arts and cultural context? Um, I mean, so in my individual context, working in RIDE, we certainly have, um, I think there's types of programming that I've um, been working on and that we've presented that really would probably never have happened if it wasn't for being forced into it through COVID. So we look to deliver for example, we did a professional development course delivered by emails that um, we piloted with the arts community and now we're reworking um, for, to support grant writing for the general community. And a program like that probably just would never have existed if we weren't like trying to think of other ways of delivering. And I'm doing another program in partnership with a radio partner. And again, we probably never would have ended up there if it wasn't for COVID. Um, but yeah, look, in many ways, I think like kind of like what I was saying before as well, I sort of think it's a bit hard to make assessments about something whilst you're still in it and also when probably some of the waves of repercussions or results of this have probably not hit us yet. So, yeah. And coming back to the course itself, what what would be reflecting on it to Craig you're in your third year now probably some days feels like it's your fifth year because we've had to you know defer because of the international work etc and Yasmin for you it's been a few years what would have been some of the highlights for you in the course what what was what did what met your expectations Craig uh, yeah I'm happy to kick that one off um yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I guess, you know, you always come to something like this with expectation, but I try not to let that, you know, weigh me down too much. And this was, for, this for me was really an opportunity to get out of my comfort zone. I didn't know what that was going to look like. Uh, but what the, the really, real, you know, meaningful work for me that happens is the work that happens at the intensives with uh, the cohort. So I don't know how many we are at the moment, but maybe 10 to 12. (laughs) Um, But, um, you know, every time we got together, you know, it might have been a really hard week at work and I'm, you know, on the bus to Sydney and I'm thinking, oh gosh, I've got to get through this intensive. But then when you're there, 
the conversations are so energizing and they're so deep and you know because it's NIDA you're doing some quirky things as well that are totally out of my comfort zone but you know and you're sitting there thinking why are we doing this and then at the end you reflect and you're like wow that was you know unbelievably amazing and you know I feel silly for even judging it <laughs> before I did it. Um, but really it's the, yeah, the highlights are always the intensives and the the openness and, uh, you know, generosity of the cohort members to, you know, work through some, you know, sometimes quite lofty academic theoretical concepts with their day-to-day -day practice. Uh, one of my cohort were, attempting to restructure their small to medium organization and we sat down and used that as the uh, you know stimulus for the task at hand and we worked through challenges with that person um you know how much that impacted it i'm not sure but you know it, it's those it's those kinds of conversations that keep you energized and and you realize that the, these conversations and discussions and the learnings that are happening are having a real impact uh, on people's careers and their their place in the sector and it's definitely you know had a huge impact on on my career the way i started to see things and and observe things happening and then how i started to talk about particular issues in the workplace change so you know that's really the, the greatest highlight of, of what's happened over the last few years for me yeah, I mean, I think I'd probably echo most of uh, Craig's comments. Like if anyone ever asked me what's the best thing about um, the NIDA Masters, for me, without a question, it's the people. The cohort, um, like the cohorts, I think because they're small and because you do have that intensive experience there, my experience of it was that it was very hugely supportive and you just, I learned so much from the people I was studying with and being able to like hear about as Craig was saying, like what's going on for them in their workplace and the context they're working in was just a huge, huge learning curve. All the lecturers were amazing. And I think again, just that classic NIDA great networks thing, you know, the guest speakers and presenters that came in, which is people that I feel like I would never otherwise come into contact with. And then again, I'm just gonna keep coughing your answer, Craig, because I think it's also the conversations and the depth of thinking that the masters allows you to have is this total luxury that I think it's, you know, and now being a few years out, I appreciate it all the more. It's just time to think really deeply and critically about stuff that's so important and foundational to the work we do, but that you so rarely get time to really think about and think about intentionally. Um, and I think like, yeah, early on in the masters, I decided I was going to make every assignment really relevant to the job that I had at the time. And I was able to totally do that. So everything was either feeding into some work or projects I was doing outside. So it was hugely relevant as well. Yeah, thank you. That's certainly the case. One of the things that's so great about the course is that while each subject has various assignments, it'll be group presentations or uh, in individual online work or it'll be a you know a major piece of essay writing anywhere between three and seven thousand words for different types of uh, different subjects um, that frame is there but you students get to choose what it is that they're going to work with and so it's it's on the one hand the the capacity and possibility to work with something that's incredibly relevant to your current practice or as Craig was saying, it was also an opportunity to work completely outside your comfort zone and to jump into some research or into a project or a topic that you didn't really know very much around. And what did that then inform? How did that then inform your, your practice? But equally, there would have been some significant challenges and there are significant challenges in being able to least of all balance study and work, etc. But within the course itself, what would you say were, were particular challenges for you? I'll kick off the challenges. I mean, I think probably the most common challenge and one that I myself also had was just that um, balancing of studying and working and at the same time, and um, then also just trying to look after yourself through that process. So you're not always working, studying or feeling guilty about not working or studying. Um, but yeah, that's probably was the biggest one. I think also for me, it hadn't been a huge amount of time uh, since I'd studied last, so I wasn't 
too uncomfortable with going through the university processes, but I know some of my um, cohort who had had a longer gap between when they'd done their undergraduate and their postgraduate, that was the other probably most common um, challenge people had was just going back into a university and academic environment and then going through all the sort of bureaucratic uh, uni processes or like what is an essay structure again or things like that so but I know um that yeah my people in my cohort who had that experience felt really supported by NIDA to access skills to help them um get back up to speed on that one yeah I think um likewise our cohort there were people who've been working in the art sector for you know 30 plus years and you know the the shock of being back in a tertiary setting although night is a little bit different than a you know sandstone university i must say um <laughs> which is fantastic um which might have challenged me a little bit perhaps i'm very um you know as a museum curator and a historian i've, I've always been very disciplined in terms of academia and so some of the challenges I faced were more of opportunities than they were challenges and it was about getting out of my head, being a bit more in my body and, you know, being open to different ways of learning and sharing and understanding. Um, so while that was challenging, they were good challenges, you know, and, and you know, role playing, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was uh, something that I've never really done before. but. And I was terrified, um, but you know it is NIDA. It's a perform. You know they they do draw a lot on the performing arts methodologies um, to inform some of this work. And you know, take moving from what I know to that is it is a challenge, but it's also it's just been hugely um, amazing. And I think on the talking about the balancing of this with you know quite a demanding job, uh, I think you've got you. You, you get what you give, right, with anything. So, you know, you can put your whole heart and soul into this and get back great, great things, but you can also build it into being part of your day job as well. And if you understand it on those terms, then, you know, you, the, the guilt sort of <laughs> goes away a bit in terms of that, you know, student mentality. And, and actually, you know, it didn't take me long to realise that you know, most of what I was engaging with, all the bits that I needed from what I was engaging with, I was applying almost immediately in my work context. And so, you know, undertaking what looked like, you know, what looks like a university structure in terms of assignments and essays and 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 whatnot was just really an extension of what I was doing and, and building my capacity and what I was doing, um, particularly in the context of sort of uh, advocacy, internal, external, you know, whatever that looked like for me, how I was able to speak about um, certain issues, you know, I might have just been reflecting on that the weekend before, you know, so it's about how you frame that within your own world and how it makes sense. And and what I found was more often than not, um, Carolyn and Nida have been, you know, super flexible and greatly supportive of us as professionals and, and I never felt like a student. I felt like a colleague. I felt like a colleague this whole time. So working through those challenges um, together to get to the, the most appropriate solution for our context at any given time. You know, I moved cities halfway through the course. I changed jobs twice, you know, <laughs> um, you know, so so these are all challenges. They're life challenges and we all have them, but um, it's a great supportive community, which I think Yasmin's already mentioned. Yeah, thank you. And that's such a great point because you know, it's very interesting. A student will often come in, and and indeed, you are all professionals. It's you know the word the word student sometimes is very difficult to voice, um, but come in with going, oh well, I, you know, this is what I'm going to work on, and this is where I'm going to go with my international placement, and and inevitably that will change within the first few months. It'll change because you are suddenly in a world of, oh my God, I'd never thought about that before or this before. And also um, many students engage in areas that uh, that are very, they're very passionate about, but there is very little research around. That can be very much the case in First Nations practice, for example, or in the case of a student who uh, graduated a couple of years ago was very much looking at the world 
of art in the in a, in a time of crisis and and did her her work for example in a refugee camp and was looking at where is art and culture in the world of looking after people who are going through severe crises so but very little research around available so one of the things that's quite challenging is then identifying the areas that you really want to focus on and then with all of us finding the support and the resources to help you um, articulate that particular those challenges and that 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 area of research that you're engaging in and the point that you've both made too is that um, life happens and when you're challenging when you have the challenge of you know, full-time work, whatever your practice as an independent artist or working in a in a gallery or museum or a theatre company, whatever your practice is, you are working full-time in that practice. You're studying. Uh, you may live in Western Australia, Northern Territory, South Australia. You are coming to Sydney four times a year when we don't have COVID. And when we do have COVID, we're doing our intensives online. So we are constantly evolving and it, there is a fluidity around the engagement in the course that is both ways. It's, um, you know, I take a night it takes incredibly seriously the time commitment and the financial commitment that students make to the course. And in turn, it's also important for us to find the ways to help you to, to secure your graduation. And um, that may mean sometimes that we have flexibility around extending for a year, or it may be that, um, you know, a certain student will have done ex excellent work for the first 18 months. And in that last six months, there have been scenarios at home or whatever, but that, you know, we will continue to support those scenarios. So that's a really important part. It isn't like a university. And I should clarify for those who are listening and watching that, NIDA is its own academic institution. It's a self-accredited training institution. It's not part of the University of New South Wales. Um, and it's one of what we call the Arts Eight. And there are eight training institutions in Australia. There's NASDA, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Dance. There's AFTERS, the Film School. There's NICA, the National Circus School, etc. So there are eight of them and, and NIDA is one of them. Are there any, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll soon see if we have some questions. We may have a couple of questions, but would there be coming from both the, you know, the wonderful aspects and the challenging aspects, what would be some advice that you would give to somebody who is thinking about applying for the course for next year? I just say do it. <laughs> I got so much value out of it. I, I genuinely, it was, it was amazing. It, um, opened my world up in terms of just knowing what else was out there and how I saw the arts and cultural sector. And I also got a huge amount of, I think, confidence through going through that process and seeing the value of the perspective that I brought as someone working at that time mostly in the independent sector. And um, sometimes you can just feel like you're just DIYing it at home and you have no idea. But, you know, it really it, it, it felt very... Um, almost quite legitimising in some ways, but also just, yeah, through those connections, through the people and the relationships you build there, you're just creating this amazing network to then expand, build, grow on. I just think go for it. I mean, do think ahead, I guess, over the next couple of years. But like Craig said, I also changed where I lived, changed jobs multiple times, travelled overseas for six months <laughs> during uh, the time that I was doing this degree. So I think... It's something where absolutely life happens through that period and you just can bring it along with you. Hmm. I actually just wanted to pick up on what you said um, before, Carolyn, about not being able to articulate something that you might want to research or might want to do. And I would say that if, you know, I hear it all the time be coming from a sort of history, historian background, people always say, oh yeah, I want to do a PhD and I want to do it on oh, something like this. And they can't really work out what they're trying to say. You know, and people sit on those things for years, if not decades and nothing happens. So I guess my advice would be to, you know, in thinking about taking this on, it is an opportunity to work through some of those things that often sit on the back burner of, you know, day-to-day -day jobs and, and running companies and managing major complex projects. And it's it's giving yourself permission to do that thinking. It's also giving yourself permission to grow because we can all grow no matter where we are within a hierarchy, within our lives, you know, and I think to 
if you're thinking about it, you're probably ready for it <laughs> in terms of wanting to take a leap of faith because all of, uh, you know, these things are leaps of faith. And I think, you know, you do have to um, leap with a, with a brave demeanour and, um, and, and be prepared to, to put in the work. Uh, and it is work on yourself. So, you know, that's the thing I think about this course is I wasn't necessarily prepared for how much work on myself happened throughout this and how much reflection of my own leadership style or, you know, how I held myself, you know, abstractly, <laughs> not physically. Um, but yeah, so if, you, if you're thinking that, you know, there's something in you that wants to do something different, that wants to change, that wants to learn or grow, then this is definitely something that I, I would highly recommend because the, the things you think it will impact are probably not the things that it actually impacts. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. I think I have a couple of questions, so I'm just going to go into our new system here to see if the questions are coming up. But I know that one of them was around, um, and I, I think you've answered it to a degree, but it's an interesting one. Has the degree enhanced your career opportunities? Um, I'll, I'll kick that one off because definitely. Um, I uh, So like I said earlier, I'm now working in local government in arts and cultural development. <clears throat> um, the council I work in, uh, we have a team of one in that area. So I'm doing the full spectrum from strategy and policy through to delivering programs and projects. Um, and at the time that I transitioned, I had not done anything in policy or government before. And um, I definitely put it, uh, you know, like I think doing this course helped me understand the landscape, it helped me understand policy, advocacy, the role of government in supporting an ecosystem, a cultural ecosystem. And it meant that I had opinions and views and ideas of how, like, you know, and I had lots of benchmarks as well of like what really good leadership in, in my case, local government arts contexts were. And then when I kind of saw this opportunity and went for the role, it meant that despite the fact I hadn't worked in it before, I had quite a broad context, had quite a good understanding and um, was really excited by the leadership opportunity and potential of working in arts in local government, mm. so, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I agree. The, you know, in the last uh, almost three years I've moved from being that highly skilled curator that I was talking about to now working at the executive level in a federal government agency and I don't while I was probably on my way there I think you know what this course taught me is how to um, you know articulate some of those more complex issues it allowed me to be again more self-aware of how I was interacting with you know others in the context of my work what space I was making what space I was holding and so you know I, through, you know, moving that quickly from a practitioner to a leader within an, a large institution, um, you know, I do credit quite a lot of that in terms of my thinking and my reflection on myself to this course, because I don't know if I would have given myself enough time to do that without, you know, jumping into to a bit of structure. Mm. Look, I'd have to say, Every, I, everything that you're saying is exactly what I feel as course leader. It's been, for me, an extraordinary time since the beginning of 2019 to really go through that journey with you. You know, it's it's a, it's the, the reflection and the learning. I have a couple of other questions here. One is, um, one is around the flexibility. So when you're speaking about deferring for six months or the flexibility of the timeline of the course, are the fees flexible too? Do they defer the, to the following year? So that is correct. If if there is a, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, there's a formal process to go through, but once that process happens and, and a student defers a subject, then the fees for that subject are deferred with the subject. So that is all part of the process. And another question is, do you remain connected with your NIDA cohort for onward professional development and problem solving? Uh, well, as I graduated a few years ago, so maybe I'll, um, yeah, so definitely. I mean, I think, um, you know, life, like probably talk to some people with my, within my cohort a bit more than others, but I absolutely know that I could email anyone from our year in NIDA tomorrow and just ask them a question, ask them for some advice, 
let them know I'm in their city and I would love to have a coffee, which would be great because right now I'm in Sydney, so <laughs> that's not happening. But um, and absolutely. So those connections, I think, are really deep and strong and um, they continue to be people that I really admire and learn a lot from and are connections I'm really grateful to have in my life for sure. And I'm not finished the course yet, but um, I'm almost there. Uh, but I can sort of say what I can say is that, you know, I am on the phone to these people for uh, talking to uh, talking to them about non NIDA stuff. You know, if I just need a, another ear, if I just need some validation, if I just need in terms of the decisions I'm making, you know, if I want to talk something through, I'm on the phone. We also use social media uh, to connect as a group regularly. And, and that is, you know, as much about supporting each other as information sharing. Um, and I would probably say that 75% of that content is not necessarily related to NIDA uh, at the moment because we're nearing the end of our um, uh, time with NIDA. But um, yeah, look, I, I feel really connected with these people. And like Yasmin said, you are connected to particular people more than others. Um, but again, if I thought about who they might have been right at the beginning, they're definitely not the people I thought. So, <laughs> you know, so it's really interesting who who drives you and who motivates you and who, who can support you in ways that you can't support yourself. And I think that's, you know, one of the beautiful things about people and this course. And certainly I was talking with somebody who um, graduated in, uh, I think it would have been in 2019, and um, they, that cohort has stayed very connected through the COVID. Um, you know, each cohort is, is different. And in one particular cohort, there were quite um, a lot of people in the cohort who came from regional Australia. We always have people from regional locations in, in the cohorts, but this had probably three or four people. And of course, so they were staying connected and every month they would ring in and or, or zoom in and, and talk about what, how are they dealing with some of the critical issues? What decisions were you making? You know, how was it? How are you making changes? And it was an incredibly supportive process. And just another quick story. There is another one of your cohorts, Jasmine Jo, who graduated also. And she she told me a story at the beginning of last year, I think it was, when she was, um, you know, called into a, a, a meeting with the Premier and a press conference and the Australian, the Federal Minister for the Arts was there and and she was suddenly sitting next to him in a dinner. It was all quite unexpected. But she said, you know, if I hadn't done the master's course in cultural leadership, I would never have been able to hold a conversation with him about cultural policy <laughs> for about 30 minutes. So, you know, there are some there are great outcomes. We have an, another uh, question. Does the course support uh, investigation into the intersection of education, youth, arts, theatre and inquiry? with our youth, our future at the centre. Um, so definitely, you know, th this, this course supports your investigation. What, what are the areas that are critical to your practice? What are the areas that you really want to research and, um, and be able to develop in terms of your own practice, your own career, how you want to uh, create change and, and, and shape change? So that would, just from that one sentence, I'm going, absolutely, that would be an amazing area for your endeavour um, in the course. Um, and certainly we would then be working with you in terms of research and resources and, um, and um, again, looking at um, potential guest speakers who would be terrific to have in the, in the intensive. Um, it sounds like the course is a big mix of people coming together from various mediums and practices, not just theatre. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, really, um, it's kind of, it's interesting because a lot of people go, I'd never, I would never have thought that a course like this would be at NIDA because NIDA is so focused on the performing arts. Um, but actually, it's a great credit to the then CEO, Lynn Williams, who, who um, the course was built in 2015 and delivered for the first time in 2016. And as I said, it was absolutely that there really isn't a course like this in Australia that offers that the, the possibility of a platform for people from different disciplines. If you want to focus on management, there are amazing, you know, degrees in management. If on curating, there's, you know, masters in curating. There are many different types of 
absolutely amazing master's degrees in Australia, but nothing that quite brings the intersectionality and interdisciplinary aspects together um, as this one does. Um, so, yes, it, it's not only theatre, but if you do come from a performing arts background, you're very welcome as well. <laughs> It just happens that tonight we have two people who come primarily from a museum and visual arts background in, initially. Uh, Carolyn, can we contact you for more specific discussion when putting our application together? Absolutely. And um, I'll jump into some slides. Oh, actually, I will do that shortly uh, with some contact details. So please don't um, hesitate to contact me. I'm also happy to have a, a phone call or a separate Zoom. How did you find the work study balance in relation to time to complete the coursework and work full time? So I think we've covered that a bit. It's, it is a challenge. And one of the things that I would say is that, um, and I, both Yasmin and, and Craig mentioned this, you actually need to find your rhythm. You have to find your balance. So some people, on average, there's probably around six hours of work, possibly eight hours of work through the week and about another six to eight hours on the weekend. Now that will be, it'll be more than that sometimes and then much less than that other times. It, it'll be fluid and, and it will change, but you need to prepare for the fact that, as Craig said, you need to build it into your day. You need to build it into your week. Um, the tricky bit is when somebody will get weeks behind and then it's very hard to catch up. So that balance is one that, um, and recognising that suddenly something will happen at work, or whatever, things will happen. But if you don't have a regularity of your study pattern, um, it, it can fall apart pretty quickly and then you've got to quickly rebuild it and, and catch up. Um, I might just add to that, Carolyn, because I was working in festivals, especially towards the start of that course. So that means that you pretty much got months where you're like, I will be doing nothing else in November or whatever. And so I do think also like you can be strategic if you have the type of job where you can't, like you literally, there's like months that you can't do any work in, but then you just, it's exactly as Carolyn said, but you just have to be super organised and like I did, there was some periods, especially in first year, where I was doing assignments a couple of months in advance because I just knew that time's ruled out. So it's just about you being strategic about your time and working out how it's going to fit. And more often than not, you're really interested in what you're doing, so you want to make time for it. So if you put a little structure around that, you know, and you, you do that every week, it's like anything. It's like that Monday morning meeting you have or it's like that catch up with so and so every second Friday, you know, you build it in and it becomes second nature. Thank you. And one last question and then we'll have, we've got a, a few minutes to, for me to show a couple of slides. Are there any scholarships? Uh, we have one scholarship, which is the Luminous Foundation uh, Indigenous Fellowship in Cultural Leadership, which is a 50% uh, contribution towards the students um, study. At this point in time, we don't have other scholarships. There is fee help available for students uh, with their fees. Um, and uh, certainly NIDA and myself, we're working on the possibility of trying to secure some other scholarships, but at this point in time, we don't for this course. Can I thank Yasmin and Craig so much? It's been wonderful to have, we could go for another half an hour, um, but thank you so much for your time today. This evening, I've really appreciated the conversation. Your insights and your reflections have been incredibly valuable. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in person and in very soon, I hope. But thank you both so much. Take care. Thank you. Now, I just have a few slides to show you all as we uh, move into it. So I'm uh, finalising it. So I'm just opening it up now. Uh, here we go. And uh, where am I here? There we go. Okay, so I think you can all still hear me. So just to recap, um, these are the subjects that you would be doing in your first 12 months. So I won't read them all out again, but you can see that this is the first 12 months. And then the next 18 months are subjects that you do through the year, and then you finalize it with an international case study, um, which is a very significant immersive piece of research with an international organization. As a result of COVID, we've needed to implement some alternative ways in which students can undertake this course course and meet, meet the outcomes would still include means engaging with an international organization, but regrettably not at this point in time with international travel. 
Um, but that gives you an idea of what your 30 months will look like. The intensive dates, as I mentioned, there are four intensives per year. So the, um, your first intensive in first year is in the first week of February. That is your orientation uh, intensive. And it is only the first years. The, then the second years meet in March, but then we bring both cohorts together for the intensive in your intensive two, three and four. So as you can see there, end of April, first week of May, uh, end of June, first week of August, and then the 21st to the 25th of October. Um, these dates are, uh, in, are not flexible in the sense that, but we do record them. And if, for example, as was the case a couple of years ago, we had a student who needed to be at the Edinburgh Festival, then of course we recorded and that student was able to catch up with the assignments and so forth um, from the intensive. Um, the application process is fairly clear on the website and I do encourage you to go to the website. Um, there is also more information, of course, around all the subjects and the course and also uh, on, the on the teachers and on the alumni and testimonials. So there's quite a lot of information on the website. Uh, so an application form, detailed CV up to three pages and a personal statement outlining your interest in the course and any leadership experience that you have and that you would bring to bear. Um, originally, the, core, the closing date was the 31st of August, but uh, I have extended that to the 30th of September. So, uh, oops, my apologies. Um, what have I done there? And um, uh, interviews will be held in early October. So all of the interviews will be done via Zoom. Um, I'm looking at probably by mid-October that will happen so that everybody is advised by early mid-November of their success or otherwise um, for the course. Um, as I said, our, our, uh, our cohort numbers vary between 10 and 15 around about that number, sometimes a little, uh, a few more, sometimes a little less, depending on where we sit. And finally, uh, my details. So my email address, carolyn.brown at NIDA, edu.au. Uh, the phone number 02969776645, which is redirecting to my mobile, so I can take a call at any time. So thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's been a great pleasure to have you with us this evening for this conversation. And please don't hesitate to contact me. I encourage you to do so. And I hope that your interest in, is for 2022, but indeed it may be for 2023 as well. So please don't he hesitate to contact me for a conversation. Thank you.